Welcome back to Break Hard, I'm Matt. Before we get into what I want to talk about today, Kyle Larson did in fact go on vacation this week. I know that is a hot topic for the Yahoo sports writer Nick Bromberg. Denny Hamlin and Ricky Stenhouse Jr. and their families that joined him on the trip there. And yeah, I'm sure people are very confused by this because, oh, he has a race this weekend, like Nick said, and he's got the playoffs coming up, but this isn't the Donner party. They're not having to travel by horse and buggy down to Mexico. This isn't even like the Baja 1000. They took a plane there and then they're going to vacation and then fly up to Las Vegas, which is all in the same time zone, different countries, I understand, but separate time zones, which is hard for the geographically challenged to understand at times. I am aware of that, but I think everything's going to be okay in this situation. Just wanted to provide an update on in case Nick was watching and was sitting at home somewhere in the middle of America, very concerned about the whereabouts of Kyle Larson and if his focus was going to be on Las Vegas or not. Like I said before, his finishes at Las Vegas are uh, second, 35th, second, first, first in the Gen 7 era. I think he's going to be okay. But into what I want to talk about today. A lot of people are wondering, what happens to the charters from 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsports if they don't win their lawsuit? So let's try to you know talk about this in a broad aspect real quick. Technically, there are six charters that are mm, unaccounted for for 2025 at the moment. So obviously, there are the two from 2311 right now, the 23 and the 45, the two from Front Row Motorsports as it currently stands, the 34 and the 38, and both teams... Uh, purchased a charter from Stuart Haas Racing. Both of those charters are still stuck in escrow. Both of those charters have not been approved for transfer for by NASCAR yet because, well, there's ongoing litigation happening. So as it stands currently, NASCAR is has said that they're prepared to go into 2025 or preparing right now to go into 2025 with only 32 chartered cars, which means that there's four charters unaccounted for, which means that there's technically eight open spots next year as well. They've already begun the process of readjusting uh, the prize payout for each position, including the open positions, which will see a, boot, a bump up in payout. Um, but I'm also curious about those two other charters because Stuart Haas Racing isn't fielding those cars. And now technically they could because SHR did sign the charter agreement. So in a roundabout way, maybe Gene Haas could in fact field three cars next year if he wanted to, I guess, I think, because technically they still own them. I, that remains to be seen at this point. So we'll ignore those two charters for now. Those other four charters, though. Let's say that NASCAR prevails and that this goes to trial. The courts rule in favor of NASCAR. Well, because those teams didn't sign the charter agreement back in Atlanta when the 13 other teams did, NASCAR has reserved the right to pull those charters away from those teams at the end of the year. And if they don't get that injunction, 2311 Racing and Front Row Motorsport, that they've requested from a judge that will allow them to race with those charters in 2025 under the new charter agreement, that means they go into next year with NASCAR taking all four of those charters back and then those teams having to race as open cars, which they said that they are willing to do, which I still think is going to hurt them. So what happens to those four charters? Well, NASCAR is not going to give them back in that sense. Uh, they'll likely hold on to them for a year until the litigation is settled, assuming that like the court doesn't side with 20 or 11 racing. And they're like, hey, you got to give them their charters back and however else that would all play out. But let's say NASCAR prevails in this situation. Now they have four charters that are theirs. And then maybe two others that we're not going to talk about for right now because it really complicates things. Those four charters now are going to go back out onto the open market and teams will be able to submit bids for them and get to them. Is this maybe an opportunity for a Dale Earnhardt Jr. to get in or RFK to finally land that third charter that they want uh, to expand to three cars or something like that? Because as we saw this year, when four charters hit the market, it drives the price right down. It's a supply and demand situation. Everybody... I assume, went to economics, I hope you did, and understand at least the basics of supply and demand. If you have a you know large supply and a low demand, well, that price kind of comes down. And there wasn't an overwhelming demand for the four charters this year. Yeah, they're all spoken for. Three of them were purchased. One of those was stay in-house with Gene Haas for the Haas factory team. But if you introduce four more charters, say in 2026, the price is likely going to go down again. This year, the price was around $25 million, which is down $15 million from 2023 at the end of the year when LiveFast sold their charter to Spire Motorsports for a reported $40 million. So let's say that charter price does kind of come down to $20 million, 25. Obviously, the payout and teams will be making more money as charter teams under this new agreement. So you would imagine that the charter price isn't going to lose too much value. But 
in this instance, that might be an opportunity for some new teams to get into the NASCAR Cup Series or some teams to expand. Now, there aren't too many teams out there that are going to be able to expand, especially if the uh, three-car limit has been approved in that new charter agreement. But there is a possibility for that. Richard Childress Racing could possibly expand to three cars. Um, you have Rick Ware, who maybe could. RFK could possibly look at doing that. Uh, there are possibilities out there. Or you could have new owners come in, a junior motor sports would be a perfect example of that cog racing maybe expands to three cars there's trophy hunting after all uh so i think there's possibilities out there and i think a lot of people are curious what happens to those charters and as much as i want to be like hey this is exactly what's going to happen to them it kind of remains up in the air because they're going to sit around in purgatory until this litigation has been settled but i think if nascar does prevail on this that opens up a interesting scenario for potential new owners to come in potential teams to expand and also gives 2311 racing and front row motorsports the option to purchase those charters once again as dumb as that sounds it's basically like double jeopardy they're being tried twice and they're going to have to pay twice in this situation never saw that movie though but uh, i'm sure it was fantastic uh, at the end of the day so either way charter situation is getting very murky in the sense of like how is all of this going to play out and unfortunately we're not going to know until this litigation has been settled Thank you for coming to today's memorial service as we remember the life and career of Daniel Ricardo who is still very much on this earth with us alive actually in fact yes yeah, sorry didn't mean to scare you there he is still alive he's just not in austin this weekend because he's not a formula one driver anymore but that hasn't stopped some formula one fans from taking their fandom to obscene levels in my opinion because a memory book has been placed in the fan area at circuit of the americas this weekend in austin for fans to come by and write down their favorite danny ricardo memory or even send a message to danny rick you know a lot like you would do at a wake it even comes with a photo of cowboy rick here which looks a lot like a memorial photo those little ones that you get when you go to a visitation the ones where you're like I like the memory, but it feels like a weird trading card, and I don't know. I don't deal. I don't do well with it. Yeah, Daniel Ricciardo is still very much alive. He's just not a Formula One driver anymore, and it feels like that is a lot. And listen, I'm all for giving people their flowers while they're still here. Let them be recognized. Let them know that people love them and love their careers and everything like that. I'm totally cool with all of that. Daniel Ricciardo hasn't missed a Formula One race weekend as of yet. Yeah, this weekend after, you know, the checkered flag falls on Sunday, he will have officially missed a full Formula One race weekend, but he hasn't done that yet. And he's in his mid-30s. He's still going to be here for quite some time if all things go, you know, to plan. It just feels like this is a little bit over the top. And listen, I get it, right? He's a Formula One fan favorite. He's a Drive to Survive star, an eight-time Grand Prix winner. People really love Daniel Ricciardo. And I get it. He's a personable guy. He's fun to listen to. He's, you know, energetic and bombastic and says obscene things, which are funny most of the time. <laughs> he's, he's an interesting character. But people didn't go to these lengths when, like, Schumacher had his accident or Felipe Massa or even like Jules Bianchi, and maybe because it wasn't from the Formula One wasn't as popular then, there wasn't a drive to survive, you didn't have all of these fans that more idolized the personalities versus the driving talent. But man, having a memory book set out after he hasn't even missed an actual race weekend yet feels odd. And I get it, right? He was um, an honorary Texan. He loved, you know, he loves Texas. I said loved. He's alive. He still loves Texas. He loves Austin. He loves his race. He took a, a, you know, a horse into the paddock last year. Yeah, he's he's a big fan of the race in the area. But um, yeah, he's he's alive still. There's no R.I.P. in peace for Daniel Ricardo. It's like, hey man, you going to the race next weekend? Because he can still do that. I don't know, man. I, maybe it's just me, but he's still very much alive. He's not gone anywhere. He's not going anywhere. It just feels like people may be taking it over the top, but that didn't stop me from putting on my Sunday best here, uh, my jacket, my t-shirt, and my tie, um, and coming to today's memorial service as we remember the life and the career of Daniel Ricardo, who will likely show up at another race sometime this year or next year, or you know, be on social media posting like he did two days ago or even the day before that and riding mini bikes. And yeah, he's just not a Formula One driver anymore. And I think this this behavior is slightly weird and slightly off-putting, but that's just me. I'm interested to hear what people's comments on this are, though. So let me know in the comments what you think about 
Dale Jr.'s comments towards the uh, charter situation, as well as, you know, how fans are treating Daniel Ricardo not being at Circuit in the Americas this weekend. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Break Hard Blog.